Hi, Psychology and Motivation. Here we go. Uh, we got number 14 out of 16. We are getting dangerously close to being finished here. So, Freudian unconscious uh, and its role in, in the motivational process. Um, when we talk psychodynamic, I mean, it's a fascinating term that Freud coined. And you can see uh, the ego, the superego, the id, trying to work it out. And each of them have their own motivation, if you will. Pretty fascinating when you think about the design uh, of Freud's uh, picture of the mind. But before we go there, let's do this. And there is Digby, alas, our poor departed Digby, a uh, friend to all cats. Digby loved cats, and the cats loved Digby. And here he is with one of his myriad cats, Brain. So he's hanging out with Brain there. Brain remains, uh, but Digby has passed. So, before we begin, let's get some things out of the way. The psychoanalytic theory is rife with misinterpretation and misunderstanding. So let's just get that out front right now. The theory can be idiosyncratic and it can be complex. Evidence to support the theory was collected via non-experimental paradigms and really using primarily the case study method and we know the problems with that. Freud concepts are far ranging and ever evolving and this gives people uh, in their attempt to understand Freud some difficulties because what Freud said one day might have been changed later on and he didn't go back and re-edit those works necessarily to reflect his new understandings or his new theories. So it makes operationalization of his concepts uh, a Herculean task uh, that he large, left largely to others and he was in a position where he could theorize and then move on and theorize some more. Uh, an amazing prolific writer, right? So, Freud's dual instinct theory, we have eros, which is the instinct for life, sex, nurturance, affiliation, and then thanatos, instincts for death, uh, aggression towards the self, in terms of, you know, for example, remonstration, beating up on yourself because you've done something wrong, self-criticism, and also depression, a feeling of unworthiness, and then uh, maybe turning those aggressive impulses outward towards others so the self doesn't necessarily experience the pain involved. Remember, Eros was the original component of theory, and that was prior to World War I. Thanatos came as a concept post-World War I, and we can wonder how does Freud explain right literally tens of millions of people killing each other in trench warfare etc how do you explain that when the only uh, instinct you have is Eros so Thanatos was an add-on it was attack on and whether it was part of the original design or whether it was reactive to these new observations I leave you to to better understand and explore that but but I often wonder about it so the the dynamic hypothesis is that of intrapsychic conflict right Penelope and Penelope's got a lot of conflict surrounding me right now. As I told you maybe earlier in the lecture, she is um, getting medicated for sinus con uh, infection, which means that she has to take a CC of antibiotic orally. And that means I take, you know, the syringe sans needle and squirt that into her mouth like she didn't like that. So while she wants to be with me and she loves me, she's also, you know, conflicted in that I may torture her with medicine at any given moment. So a cat in conflict. And any you want to do therapy, you got a little cat couch you can lay her out on and she can tell you about all her deep seated fears and concerns. Right, Penelope? All right, so the dynamic hypothesis, the intrapsychic conflict, this is what Freud was about. And this is why we call it psychodynamic theory, is we have multiple desires operating at a single time. And really, the successful living is defined as reconciling those desires with each other, choosing a middle ground that allows us to satisfy as many desires as we can without violating norms, values, etc. So all behavior is dynamically motivated. Motivation arises as a process of unconscious intrapsychic conflict that presents itself as needing to be resolved. Often the conflict itself is outside of awareness and what is consciously experienced is the anxiety, the guilt, what have you. Uh, but the purpose for it remains hidden from us. So instinctual drives then 
develop into psychical representation. That is, I have this drive. It's represented in my psyche. It might then, this drive, be in conflict with defense systems. And ultimately, what I'm trying to do is formulate some kind of compromise that allows me to get my cake, eat it, and not be too eaten up by guilt for having done so, if you will. Uh, and, and neither, you know, uh, we, we see neither the complete expression of our desires, nor do we see the complete restraint. So there is always that compromise. Now, what is libido to Freud? It's one's energy or life force created by the survival and sexual instincts. So libido derives from eros, if you will, and it's tied to one's psychosexual stages in the way we express our libido. And this is where we get into a lot of problems with Freud, is these psychosexual conflicts and the psychosexual stages. And, and you know, the first stage, right? The second stage, these are playing out in infancy and toddlerhood. And people say, well, d infants and toddlers don't want sex. But it's the way that the drive is expressed during that period of time. right? So we see in infancy, the oral stage, if you will, how does an infant satisfy their need for gra gratification through the mouth. That's, you know, and we know this about infants, because what do infants do? They pick stuff up and they put it in their mouth. They pick stuff up and they put it in their mouth. The mouth is the center of their experience of the world during infancy. So gratification has to take place at the mouth. Right? That, that's, so it's not that the, 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 the infant wants sex, the infant isn't capable of having sex or doesn't know what sex is, but it is about gratification. Right? Now, gratification will become sexual when we approach adolescence, but not, not before then. Right? So the expression of the libido is tied to, to one's psychosexual stages, and that means it manifests itself differently at each of those stages. Libido is in limited supply. It's different mental, ener um, different mental processes compete for the libidinal energy. So we only have so much energy to go around, and, and our desires then are, are all saying, me first, me first, right? I want, I, I want the libidinal energy. No, I want it. I'm entitled. And, and again, more uh, psychodynamic type conflict. Now, contemporary uh, psychodynamic perspective, the unconscious, much of mental life is unconscious. Now, we social psychologists are fond of using the term non-conscious rather than unconscious. Man, as a social psychologist, especially coming out of the 90s and into the turn of the century, we are all about automatic processes. That is, the non-conscious processes. We would catalog them. We would manipulate them. We would measure them, right? but we took a very empirical laboratory-based approach. And the last thing we wanted to do was be associated with Freudian-type explanations, which were non-empirical, which were really based on observation in the case study method. So I think a lot of us developed an, a discomfort retaining the word unconscious. So non-conscious became the term that we adopted. Here's a strange thing. You know, when I was a kid, when I was growing up, they say, oh, you only use 10% of your brain, which meant 10% of your brain was devoted to conscious processes, 90% of your brain to unconscious processes back in the day. What we find now is that ratio has kind of been called into question. And neuroscientists are, are the first to suggest, many neuroscientists say, look, about 98% of your brain is devoted to non-conscious processes and about 2% you're consciously aware of. So uh, the non-conscious, the unconscious, whichever rules, and, and conscious is a very f small slice of the human phenomenon. Psychodynamics, mental processes operate in parallel with one another. So that is, I have desires, but I have constraints, and they operate at the same time, right? They interact. Now, the third is ego development. Healthy development involves moving from an immature, socially dependent personality to one that's more mature and interdependent of others. And, and this is, we look to caregivers as children to satisfy our needs, but through ego development, we learn to satisfy our own needs, right? And that's the process of growing up and maturing. Object relations theory. Well, mental representations of the self and others form uh, in childhood that guide the person later social motivation and relationships. 
So if we admire, if I'm a boy and I'm four years old and you ask me, who do you want to marry? Well, most four-year-olds, boys will respond, I want to marry mom, right? And we have to go through this process of understanding we can't marry mom because mom is dad's, right? And that would, you know, create issues. But then we have this ancient, perhaps tired old cliche, if you want, that men tend to marry their mothers. Well, that is in this object relation theory as a boy, right? I then create this image of myself. This is who I am. This is who mom is. This is the relationship between me and mom. And, and I learn that and that becomes consolidated, right? And might then form the basis according to people in psychodynamic theory of my future relationships with women you know, if I'm a heterosexual male, right? That in fact, that is the type of person who would be most appealing to me, perhaps the most comforting, the most familiar, if you will. I know, strange, but this is psychodynamic theory. And anytime you're allowed to jump off the psychodynamic bus and say, hey, I think that stuff is hooey and you'll be in good company because most people will be sitting on the same bus with you saying, I think that psychodynamic stuff is hooey. I'm sorry, I won't be on the bus with you because I think there's a lot that it has to offer. Sure, it's it's fraught with its uh, contradictions. It's fraught with the inability to demonstrate some aspects of it empirically at this point in time. But that doesn't mean I necessarily want to throw it out. Three contemporary views then on, on the unconscious. Well, there's the Freudian unconscious. Automatically appraises the environment. See what affordances are available. There's the adaptive unconscious. And this is the part of us that sets goals, makes judgments, and initiates action, often occurring outside of our awareness. And we know how to manipulate that because we talked about a non-conscious goal pursuit in an earlier lecture. And then implicit motivation, automatically attend to emotionally linked environmental events. So our past history then helps motivate us to select certain aspects of the current environment and reject other aspects of the current environment or move from an environment that produces more implicitly desired phenomenon affordances. So economic hypothesis, psychic energy. Here the idea is the psychic energy is fixed or constant. The distribution of energy determines the nature and the outcome of intrapsychic conflict. So I have so much psychic energy and the it is telling me, do it, do it, do it. You know you want to do it. And the superego is saying, no, don't do it. It's wrong. It's immoral. It's illegal. It's unjustified, whatever. Notice that my psychic energy is being devoted to both the ego and the superego. Well, it's up to the ego to determine who's going to win out, who gets the bulk of the energy. And sometimes we say my bigger half or my better half, the superego, won the day, right? But sometimes the impulses of the id win the day. And that also represents individual differences. So this drive-related energy, right? is cathexis and that's really the id's ballpark hey do it do it pursue this go after this the defense related energy often the result of the ego at behest of super ego saying no <laughs> breaks on it ain't right don't do it don't go there okay that's a very freudian uh take on this but but let's let's look at a modern example of what's called ego depletion and social psychologist Roy Baumeister brings this to us. Uh, I love this experiment, and it demonstrates this idea in the laboratory of the self's psychic resources, energy, as fixed and can be exhausted. And when it becomes exhausted, we have to rest to allow it to be replenished. So what we're going to say then is everything that we do draws on this pool of intrapsychic energy. It's drawing on the common resource. Now, what draws on this? Well, some examples, choices. Let's face it. Do I want A or do I want B? Hmm. Well, I, th these are the reasons I want A. These are the reasons I want B. And notice, now my intrapsychic energy is, if they're mutually exclusive, is divided between one or the other. Right? So I can pursue this. I can pursue that. Who's going to win out? So choices. Right? Think about it. Self-regulation is a form of choice as well. I want to do this. No, I shouldn't do this. Right? I don't want to. I don't want to do homework now. 
I want to play video games. And it's like, well, who's going to win out in this little battle? The desire to do homework or the desire to play video games? Notice it still boils down to a choice. In this case, hey, I'll do my homework now, and then I'll play the video games after I'm done, would, would be the example of what we might label most simply appropriate self-regulation. Initiation, initiating or inhibiting behavior. So if I'm sitting on the couch and I got boots on my legs and she's sitting there and we're all chill, having a great time, and I say, man, I really need to get up and do this. Initiating behavior. Well, I have to choose to do something different than I'm doing at the moment. Inhibiting behavior. Uh, you know, my neighbor blows his stupid Dukes of Hazard horn for the 18th time, and really, I just want to go punch his face, or, or, or better yet, just disconnect his horn, you know, just open his hood and rip the horn out and say, here you go, enjoy your horn, right? But as much as I want to do that, I probably shouldn't. And it will lead all, to all kinds of negative consequences, so I need to inhibit that behavior. That doesn't, dim you know, I still want to do it, right? So initiating or inhibiting behavior draw from this pool of resources. And Baumeister suggests that the cell's resources are finite. Well, this is about where Freud would have gotten to, or he might have then given us an example of two or three of his clients, right, and explained how it worked after the fact. Baumeister's an experimental social psychologist. What does he do? He brings us into the laboratory. And he then sets it up depending on the condition to which you're randomly assigned. So let's hope that we're in the first condition. We're randomly assigned. We walk into the laboratory, and, and Baumeister says, we'll be ready for you in about five, ten minutes, okay? So if you would please just sit down in the waiting room. Oh, by the way, we have these freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, which you can have as many as you want. You're welcome to some cookies if you want. But this plate of radishes over here, this is for something else, so don't touch the radishes. You can have all the cookies you want. Stay away from the radishes. Well, you know what the other experimental condition is. The other half the participants come in and they're told, hey, those cookies are for a different experiment. Leave those the hell alone and they're freshly baked. The smell is in the lab of, of these beautiful chocolate chip cookies. It says, don't eat any cookies, but we got these radishes that I grew in my garden. Take as many as you want. Well, what do you think? How many of you, is it harder to resist radishes or is it harder to resist cookies? And the idea is that the cookie condition where you have to resist cookies is going to use up your psychic energy because you're saying, don't eat the cookies. And you say, oh my God, I so want one of those cookies. They smell so good. Oh my God, they look so good. I want one of those cookies. I can just taste it. Oh, oh, but no, I can't. I'm not supposed to. Have a radish instead. Man, that's puny compensation when you're turning down cookies, right? Well, that's the setup. Now, you thought you were in the waiting room. Baumeister's already started the experiment. You've already been randomly assigned to your experimental condition. After that, 10 minutes of that, then it's the same for everyone. Come on in, and we want you to solve these puzzles. And there's a big stack of puzzles. And the puzzles are unsolvable. So what they're going to do now is, while you're in there, they're going to count. They're going to measure the amount of time you work on the puzzles and they're going to measure the number of puzzles that you actually attempt to do. Here's the idea. Puzzles use up psychic energy. So if you were resisting cookies, using up your psychic energy, then you have less psychic energy to devote to the puzzles. Whereas if you were resisting radishes, which is no big deal for most of us, you know, oh, can't have any radishes, oh, hurt me, right? <laughs> You're not using up psychic energy, at least not much. So you should have more psychic energy left over for the puzzles. So the hypothesis is simply, hey, if you're in the radish condition, that is, eat all the radishes you want. This is, radish means resist cookie. What we see is the participants spent 8 minutes, 8.3 minutes doing the puzzles, and they made 19.4 attempts. That is, this is the ego depleted group. They were resisting cookies. They use up their psychic energy. They spend less time on the puzzles and make fewer attempts. The cookie condition, on the other hand, eat all the cookies you want, but don't eat any radishes. Gotcha. 
They spent over twice as much time. Look at that. That's a huge effect for experimental research. Over twice as much time on the puzzles and almost made twice as many attempts. Right? A couple things here. The beauty of having two dependent variables. If both dependent variables then say the same story, we increase the power, the, the evidential uh, nature of our experiment, right? So we have the two variables that coincide. Now, why is there a control condition? Now, I don't know this for sure because I've only met Baumeister once and I wasn't in a situation where it was appropriate to ask him about this. But I got a feeling that he ran these two parts of the study. And then he was presenting his findings to someone and said, well, you know, cookies got a lot of sugar. Couldn't the sugar in the cookies explain people spending more time because they have more energy and more attempts because they have more energy? So he said, oh, shit, I didn't think of that. So now he needs a control condition to demonstrate that it was not the sugar at the heart of the effect. And here's the control. There's no food available. People just came straight in to do the puzzles and notice that it mirrors the cookie condition. So what we say is where the action is, is in the radish or the resist cookie condition. Ultimately, what this means, consider uh, having to take two or three exams, especially final exam time. Back in the day, when you make that bad draw and you have three final exams on the same day, how do you feel at the end of the final exam day where you took three exams? I mean, uh, you're probably spent, you're exhausted, you have no psychic energy left, you've expended it, you've left it all in your exam booklets, hopefully, right? And then your partner comes by and says, final exams are over, how are you feeling? And you go, uh, I'm glad they're over. And they say, how about I make you your favorite dinner? What would you love to have? And you go, uh, I don't know. Anything would be fine. And they go, seriously, choose something. And I, I can't make any choices. I can't even think. Your psychic energy is depleted. You can't even do something as simple necessarily as make a choice of what you would like to eat or do that evening. Right? All you want to do is chill the hell out and allow your psychic energy to rebuild. So we have here then is a beautiful demonstration an empirical uh, that provides empirical support for the idea of limits on the nature of our psychic energy. Now, let's talk tension reduction. Derives from economic hypothesis, instinctual drive creates excitation or tension. Tension is constantly present. Instinct doesn't go away, so we're always desirous, right? Fluctuations in tension are tied to psychic energy invested in the drive. How important is the desire to me? So note that some things are relatively easy to resist, like radishes. Other things are more difficult to resist, like cookies. And we'll see that this then has an effect on our subsequent behavior. So the clashing uh, uh, of the psychological forces, the conscious volition, right, is, hey, I got this idea or I got this desire or I'm, you know, under the, the situational influence of this excitation or uh, the cathexis, the ego, I mean, the it generated, you know, sexual desire, right? The unconscious counter will then is counter idea, repression, inhibition, or anti cathexis guilt, right? So here, the guilt supplies, let's say, <laughs> the necessary anti cathexis, the guilt, the id is resisting it. So that's why it seems like these are reserves. But the id is suffering under the guilt, right? A and the ego is suffering under the sexual desire. But that's what's in conflict. So Freud develops what he calls the pleasure principle. Cathexis without gratification builds tension, creating a state of unpleasure. And he coins his own terms. So the more I want it and the less that I am able to have it, it develops a state of unpleasure. And it's the state of unpleasure which is motivating, causes me to seek out opportunities to get it, so to speak. So reduction of instinctual drive through fantasy or action produces pleasure. So if, in fact, I want it, well, there's a couple ways. I can go get it or I can imagine having gotten it. Either really kind of suffices as a, uh, an element of wish fulfillment, if you will. So the reduction of unpleasure 
is the pleasure principle. And this is a primary motivation in Freud's theoretical world, that we are seeking, we're motivated to reduce unpleasure. So desire causes the unfulfilled, you know, the, the noting that the desire is unfulfilled at this point in time, the more important that unfulfillment is to me, the greater my experience of unpleasure and the greater motivational properties ascribed to that unpleasure that caused me to get up my off my ass and do something about it. Right? So we're motivated to achieve this tension-free state of pleasure. And, and essentially what that is is the absence of unpleasure. So I know it kind of strangely or awkwardly uh, kind of flips itself around. So illustration of psychodynamic then. Repression, I might try to repression, repress an urge, right? This is the, this is the process uh, of forgetting information uh, and an experience by ways that are unconscious, unintentional, and automatic. So this is a defense mechanism that's causing me to not be bothered. The unpleasure is occurring. There's nothing I can do about it. Let us then operate this mechanism that reduces the level uh, of unpleasure. So it's the ego's counterforce to the id's demand desires you know so and, and this is a largely unconscious process right so I'm trying to forget what it is I'm trying to forget what it is that the it is saying hey do this do this and I'm like ah oh, no nah, yeah, just shut the hell up I don't want to think about that right that is but notice it happens unconsciously so we have the unconscious level defense mechanism or suppression is the conscious attempt to do this it's a process of removing the thought from attention by ways that are conscious, intentional, and deliberate. And you know how most of us do this through distraction, right? So we try to consciously attend to something else to distract ourselves from what is really kind of at the top of our mind. Now, when we look at empirically supporting Freud's ideas, all, all these weird things, id, ego, superego, all these fascinating constructs, do they have any physiological, biological correlates? Do they exist in reality? Right? Do the id and the ego actually exist? Well, I mean, we can make a case for it. The, the limbic system, that is the seat of our emotion, right? The hypothalamus, the thalamus, the amygdala, the medial forebrain bundle, right? These are areas of the brain that are designed to detect pleasure and unpleasure. So we might ascribe the id to those areas of the brain. At least the, those areas of the brain and their function, we might conceptually say id-like, id-level, that they represent the id. Now the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex, the new part of the brain, right, uh, makes a pretty fair ego because the, the, the learning, memory, decision-making, intellectual problem-solving take place up here. Executive control center that perceives the world learns to adapt to it. The seed of our ability to inhibit behaviors, to choose not to do something or to delay gratification all occur here. So, I mean, at a neural level, uh, the id is saying, do it, do it, do it, and the prefrontal cortex says, ah, maybe not, or if you're going to do it, you better do it this way. And if you do it, hey, here's the benefits, but here's the potential costs, right? I mean, you may really want to have this great meal and, and go all out and spend the money on the meal, and the it's going to love you for it. It's going to say, oh, my God, that was so satisfying. That removed the unpleasure of hunger. Thank you so much, and it was such a wonderful experience. But then, you know, the ego is going to like, whoa, you blew half a week's pay on a single meal. That is not sustainable. Maybe you shouldn't do that if you haven't done it yet. Or now we've got to find some way to economize so that we don't suffer as a result of having done that. Right? So these, the neural pathways that go between these structures and the limbic system, these interrelationships, show how one system affects another. And this is why neuroscience is so freaking important to us at this day and age. There's so many questions that remain in psychology, and many of them need to be understood at the neural level. Right? So let's go for neuroscience. Woohoo! Now, ego psychology. The development of the ego. So we take Freud and his ideas that harken back to 1910, 1920, and beyond. 
We get in the 1970s, Levenger is going to revisit Freud and talk about the development of ego. And what this means is, let's set aside Freud's psychosexual stages, all five of them, and let's look at it from a more palatable, more informative aspect, something that's easier to wrap our head around. In the beginning, it's a great way to start. As infants, for example, we are symbiotic. And in the symbiotic stage, there's, we don't call any shots as infants. We just react to our environment. The id makes itself present. It says, hey, you are hungry. Hey, you are uncomfortable. Hey, you got to go to the bathroom. The symbiosis is your caregiver has to meet these needs for you because you're incapable of doing it yourself. So you're symbiotic. That is, you're tied tightly to your caregiver, right? Now, notice toddlerhood. What's well, one of the words that we learn in toddlerhood? This is the impulsive stage. Well, we learn no. And we love, we delight in telling our caregivers no. So they tell us, I want you no, 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 no. Toddler's favorite word almost? No. I think toddler's favorite word is I want, right? But notice it's all impulsive, okay? Now, the next stage, self-protective, what we see is we're beginning to develop a sense of self as we move out of toddlerhood. And the sense of self then gains in value. And we start building the sense of self. And one of the basic needs at this point in time then is to protect what we're developing at that point. Many of us then find out that one of the best ways to function, that is to interrelate with others, to protect the self, is to conform. And that is to operate in a way that conforms to the norms, the values, the rules, the laws of society. It really is the safest way to go. Just mind your P's and Q's, do as you're told, and everything will be okay. Right? And for a 10-year-old, learning the rules, 12-year-old, that's the way to go. And most people tap out just about at that level. Just do as you're told, get along. If your boss says jump, you say hi, how high, right? And uh, buy a house that looks like everybody else's house. Here's the approved cars, you know, for someone of your nature and status. Just, it, this is the fashion, so do this. Don't question it. Popular movies, yeah, you want to watch this one because everybody else's. And, and many people, you know, resonate into that kind of uh, role in society. Now, beyond that, we see conscientiousness, and this is when we begin to behave in a way that we're, we're calling our own shots and we do it because we believe it's the right thing to do. And that leads us then to the potential to become free, wheeling, autonomous individuals, right? Note that most people don't fully develop. And, and it's interesting, this is a six-step stage uh, that's not dissimilar from Kohlberg's theory of moral reasoning, which presents with six stages, and Kohlberg taps most of us out at the fourth stage as well. So these stage theories have gained a lot of traction o over the years, and uh, they tend to resonate with people. Now, if we look at ego as a process, ego development can be construed as a process we move through, and all of us move through this process, and it is kind of universal. Now, we may stop the process at a relatively immature state and not make it all the way up, and that would be the case for most people, right? So, ego guides our perception of and response to the world around us. Some people as adults, remain impulsive, right? They just act on whatever they feel at the moment. And if we want to reincorporate Freud into this discussion, they're largely id-driven. The psychic energy is devoted to the id, and the superego that puts the corrections or the breaks on the id's behavior is underdeveloped or doesn't exist at all. So these people just do whatever impulse, uh, they follow whatever impulse, uh, you know, comes at them. And, and note that, that some people get into a problem with credit card debt. And, and really what's, what's happening is, is it's impulsive. That is, I want that and I'm going to buy it now because I want it. And you know, if the ego was getting more psychic energy, it would say, well, I understand that you want that and it's not even bad that you want that, but are you willing to give up in terms of consequence, what it means to have that now. And think about it. If people are buying things on a credit card, God, I really want this now, and I'm going to buy it on my credit card, 
what you're now committing to is paying anywhere from what 12 to 18 to 20 percent interest so what you're saying is I want this so badly right now I'm willing to pay almost 50 percent twice as much for it over time but if the is in charge then we don't think about that we don't even consider that yeah but think how cool it'll be and, and we explain it away the practicality of it uh, so motivational importance then of ego development the ego develops to defend against anxiety and where's the anxiety man I really want that I would look so cool in that outfit I would be like the poo if I had that and I want it now because I need to look like the poo right now right and and I start feeling anxious because I don't because I, I'm in a state of deprivation or what's the term unpleasure so I take out the charge card and, and I put it down and I'm good to go and I'll worry about paying later right so the ego develops uh, to empower the person to interact more effectively and proactively with the surroundings and so you know I really want that and let me see if I can develop a plan to get that without charging it on my credit card right so how can how can I make this happen ego defense changes in internal or external reality so environmental dangers right all conflict with the environment instinctual presses from the id conflict with the impulses and then conflict with the conscious is the superego demands this is what's driving it this is what's ego defense is about so all these can be competing for your intrapsychic energy right so maybe something you want in some way conflicts with the environment but the id continues to press on and the superego says hey no uh, that would be a bad idea right well the defense mechanisms then buffer and reduce the anxiety that is attempt to and, and think about this appropriate not appropriate but effective use of the defense mechanisms ultimately reduce our experienced anxiety distress and dis depression that are the result of the environment the superego and the id all at once so these three aspects are operating together and the defense mechanisms then reduce potentially the effect on our level of anxiety distress and depression what does this mean well it means people with robust defense mechanisms right are going to be strangely less depressed than people with intact defense mechanisms okay they're going to experience less stress as a result of it. And that's what the defense mechanisms are for, at least in the short term. But what we find is, hey, I really wanted that outfit. Hey, I put up my credit card. I feel really good now, right? It's, it's you know, I'm entitled. You rationalize it. That's a defense mechanism. You only live once. Man, if I get this, it's, it's going to solve my problems. Oh, my God, this is so good, you know better do it now because it might not be available later and we tell ourselves all these things and notice then it diminishes our anxiety for having made that purchase the robust use of the defense mechanisms the downside is is that if we're playing a game of long ball what happens is that down the road six months from now a year from now when I'm still paying for this item and I've purchased many more items and now my credit card is maxed out and I'm not paying my bills notice then the anxiety becomes very robust so a lot of times the defense mechanisms are eliminating the anxiety they're just pushing it off to a later date right? and part of maturity is for us to learn to understand that and, and usually we have to do that through experience so effectance motivation is the tendency to explore and influence one's environment notice how perceived control that we talked about in the past lecture right perceived control then can also be tied to our effectance motivation to the extent that I believe I have control within this domain uh, might in fact serve to increase my effectance motivation effectance meaning I can in fact affect the environment and make shit happen especially I can make shit happen that's the shit I want to happen right it arises from experience to demonstrate one's competence this uh, situation is not that dissimilar from this other situation I've been in before I made that work I'm gonna make this one work right it's central to competence motivation theory developed by harder and that is the role of perceived competence 
as feeding to increased motivation to take on a task. We move toward domains where we have demonstrated competence or mastery. And that is, there are certain domains where we can ply our wares, do our thing, and with increased likelihood of success. Right? And it derives from the feedback we receive, beginning in childhood. So often, you know, uh, sometimes it's surprising that I didn't become a lawyer. My parents, um, all, my, all my relatives said, ah, you're going to become a lawyer. You have to become a lawyer because you love to argue so much. And that was possible, right? But that would be the feedback that I'm given as a child. You can see how that feedback, and I incorporate that feedback. And what does that mean? Likely that I might argue more and learn to argue more and more. I'm the one in class who's raising the hand and offering counter explanations to the teacher or engaging the teacher in arguments. And as I'm successful in those arguments, it's going to increase my desire to do it more. And then I might choose ultimately an occupation or argument becomes a, a central component of it. And is it interesting that I eventually I ended up in graduate school and that's all about arguing, evidence-based arguing. That's what research is, when you get right down to it. It's providing support or refuting arguments that you're given. So, ego effectance. Well, White's model of effectance motivation. The effectance motivation, let's go straight down from there. It's the willingness to exercise, emerging and existing skills and capabilities. This is something that happens to us in graduate school when we're doing experimental research. Our effectance motivation, let's call it what it is for the moment, but then the more that we believe we're able to argue effectively a point, the more willing we are to do so, right? So the inevitable effects of changes in the environment, they occur, voluntary attempts to produce intentional, goal-directed changes in the environment. When successful, a sense of competence increases, okay? And that then that competence feeds to our effectance motivation. The more competent I feel, the more I believe I can make a difference, then the more willing I'm to participate in activities where I can demonstrate that ability. So, one of the best motivators as we move away from this is, according to at least the effectiveness motivation, one of the best motivators is the belief that we can. And that would be supported by the actual results in our previous attempts. Freud's drive theory. Let's take a look at it. Revisit it here just for a moment. Bodily deficit, also known as unpleasure, right, is the source of drive. The intensity of the psychological discomfort, that is, as that unpleasure increases, it then gains in its motivational impact, right? Now, the object of the drive is the environmental object capable of satisfying that bodily deficit. So whether it's a piece of cake in the refrigerator or it's an object of our desire across the tavern, right, uh, to the extent that, that this, this drive increases, the level of unpleasure increases, the greater my motivation to attain the object of my drive. And that's the satisfaction by removing the bodily deficit. So when I finally get it, get to the refrigerator, right, you know, my superego saying, you shouldn't eat that cake, you know, have you measured your waistline lately? I think the last thing you need is cake, uh, et cetera. But I overcome it because the impulse it becomes so great, right? And I say, that cake will make all the difference. The object of my drive, the aim of the drive, will remove this bodily deficit. It will deliver me from unpleasure, if you will. So the development of mental representations of the self through your relationships with others is part of this ego development. That is, how am I, what do I look like as this process is occurring? And this is what yields object relation theory. It's the quality of uh, it's the quality of anyone's mental representation of relationships can be characterized by these three dimensions. That is the unconscious tone, uh, benevolent versus malevolent. So is this good or bad? Right. The capacity for emotional involvement, selfishness, and narcissism. Right. And, and that's where we see the impulsive and and Levinger's 
uh, ego model, we see like the, the bottom two, the, not the symbiotic, but let's go to the next higher one, the impulsive, right? The impulsive versus, let's say, the conscientious, and you can see that in Levenger's, uh, the distance between those two. And then the mutuality of autonomy with others, that is to what extent are we operating in autonomous rather than symbiotic relationships. And notice, that is the extreme poles of Levenger's theory. Well, let's suppose that a woman uh, presents herself to a psychologist, and if we want to look at object relation theory and understanding how this woman operates and how she processes information about her environment that might lead to her behavioral choices, if the topic of conversation in the therapy session is relationships with men, and men then become the object, right? Well, what is her perception? Well, there's enslavement, and that is household and sexual enslavement, if you will, seems to be a component of her general perception of relationships with men. That is the object relation. So, relationship with men, that's the object, right? And here's the nature of the relations. And then sexuality. Dirtiness, rape, enslavement, pleasurable activity. And notice that there's conflict in this woman's presentation of her object relations. That is, on the one hand, sexuality, her sexuality is dirty, ooh, taboo, nasty, right? But on the other hand, you know, she's engaged in the sex act and found it pleasurable at times. So how do you reconcile these? And this is a lot of what Freud was about, was these conflicts, that the superego is saying, hey, don't do that, especially if you're unmarried, you can't have sex, what a horrible thing. But, you know, the, the it is saying, well, no, it was actually pleasurable. And the ego might get in there as well, right? And then when we look at the negative versus the positive aspects, the rejection. So men, oh man, they can serve as a source of rejection. And I remember the self is rejected by boys. That time in the cafeteria when that boy got up and wouldn't sit next to me, or that boy who stopped calling me and promised he loved me, or dances when I stood there and no one asked me to dance, right? And my father was never close to me. I always felt rejected from my father, right? But then, there was also times when I experienced closeness in my relationships with men. Closeness with my father that time, you know, or that closeness with the boy on vacation. But remember, he didn't. So all of this is part of this woman's understanding of her relationships with men. Hence, object relations theory, right? And in psychodynamic type therapy, the talking cure, then I've got to talk through all of this. And, and, you know, move through and, and bring the hidden aspects of this, much of which might have been suppressed or repressed, bring those up to the surface and work through those and come to understand how the person is influenced by their perceived relationships and their past relationships with uh, the object. I don't know. All right. So criticisms of the psychodynamic approach. Well, as it stands now, and it has stood for a good long time, a lot of these concepts are probably not scientifically testable. Although, I'll step back from that. I, th I, think, the, I think a lot of them are, are testable, but we have to be very creative about it, all right? Motivational, con uh, motivational concepts arose from case studies of disturbed individuals, and that is a big problem. Note that social psychologists... Who are my participants? They're you guys, right? So, you know, Ohio State sophomores and freshmen, that's who comes to a social psychology laboratory as part of their Psych 1100 requirement to do seven hours of research experience. We see in social psychology people who are essentially, and I hate to say, you know, but are, are essentially normal. This is, we get an average picture of humankind. Note that Freud's experience with his patients, participants, if you will, is largely people who are suffering significantly that were disordered individuals. So it's natural for Freud's ideas to be built around his observation of how people with a certain level of psycho psychopathology operate. Whereas, for example, a social psychologist, we're talking about how people, or even more so a humanistic or positive psychologist, is talking about how people can achieve potential. Much different world. Many points about human motivation and emotion were simply wrong. 
the, the theory of superego formation, and that's up to conjecture still. The methods of data collection, case study is not the best way to go. Case study is a great place to start and generate hypotheses. But it, it's not the end point. I would consider it the start point. And and psychoanalytic theory is woefully uh, as woeful as a predictive uh, process. And that's where you know uh, we have a theory. We develop a hypothesis, and we say, I believe this is the way it works, right? And, and then we conduct some experiments, and we lend support to the hypothesis, and we say, okay, based on that, then we should be able to manipulate this, and we predict that this will occur. And the psychoanalytic theory doesn't get us uh, very well predictively. So, that's about it. Tremendous motivational potential. Uh, and, and again, we re reiterate that some motivations are, you know, largely conscious. Others may be largely non-conscious, especially when defense mechanisms have been employed. And that's about all I got. So I hope you guys have a good day. And uh, Rosie and I wish you the best. Bye.